Hey everyone, welcome to Group Text. My guest today, documentarian Tommy Avalone, whose new documentary on Peacock is called I Love You, You Hate Me. It charts the incredible, true, which is crazy, backlash to the rise of the world's most famous singing dinosaur, Barney. Okay, let's just jump right in. Good morning, Tommy. Welcome to Group Text. Thanks for having me. So right off the bat, what made you want to tackle this topic? Yeah, I saw this old 1993 news broadcast of a Barney bashing event at the University of Nebraska. And these college kids were just beating up Barney, like ripping him up, throwing darts at his face. At the end, the newscaster said, well, that's the future of our country right there. And I was like, oh, my God, we're living in that future. And there's a lot of hate going on. I wonder if you could tell a story of love and hate, but told through the eyes of Barney the dinosaur. So it wasn't like I was like, you know, Barney would be a great story. It was just I saw this and then we started doing research and kind of found this, these crazy events that happened. How do you pitch this? I mean, you have a great production team next to you. <laughs> I mean, I'm, how do you I'm go awful. in it? How do you go in and say, so I'm going to make a documentary about Barney, who I see is lurking over your shoulder there? Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the props from our movie made by Jim McKenzie. So it's a, uh, we smashed the Barney, some of our B roll. But yeah, I mean, I we teamed with Scout Productions. They do uh, Queer Eye, Legendary, The Hype. And Trent Johnson, who was working there, he's like the pitch man. You know, I, uh, I, I am not a good pitcher, you know, so he's just like, we on deal and tell the stories has the arc and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, is a, uh, you know, there's nostalgic, uh, ness to Barney. Uh, but then also just the story was, you know, in, in the way we related to Barney, it was a unique way of approaching the subject. So if I've done it right. You were, how old were you in 92 when Barney hit the airwaves? I was 10. So it was, you were already a little too old for Barney. Yeah. For sure. I mean, so much so that like once we got a little bit older, me and my friends would make like comedy skits. With our, you know, and I asked my Aunt Ro to make a Barney suit so we could beat up Barney in it. And I have all and like I snuck a little bit of the old videos in the documentary. It's just so uh, you can see my friend Timmy dressed like Mr. Rogers beating me up. <laughs> so you were a Barney hater. You know, it's like you, where does hate come from? Right. And I just, you know, I didn't, he, Barney, I was too old for Barney. I didn't understand Barney. So yeah. And then looking back after we're starting to make this documentary, we're like, well, why would I have done that? You know, it's, you, you just see all these other people making fun of Barney, like friends made fun of Barney, uh, full house, you know, it was just everywhere. It was a Leno, it was a Letterman. So you just think, yo, it's the cool thing to do to make fun of this purple dinosaur, but you really don't know what you're doing. Yeah, my son caught the tail end of the Barney rant. Is that a pun? Was that a pun? <laughs> so, oh, you're right. It is. But I'm bummed. <laughs> then what happened? I mean, why do you think people in huge numbers turned, like, it, for something to be, ma- be able to make fun of and everybody to understand it? And I know this, my mom would always say this about when people would say, why do you, who do you decide to make fun of in your act? The public has to have such a huge working knowledge of what it is to be able to get the joke. So it's so bizarre to me to think about the fact that Barney was that big that he became a, na- making fun of him became a national obsession. It was, I mean, he was everywhere. Like they started off on tapes, you know, they made their own tapes were very, very low budget. Uh, that was 1988. 1992, it got on PBS, but 1993 is what they called their Elvis year. And it was just huge. It was everywhere. I believe they sold out like 11 straight days at Radio City Music Hall. You know, uh, they just were selling millions of dollars with the toys and the, the show was just so successful. It was just crazy. But to some of you are saying like, you know, there are these different reasons why certain people hated Barney. And it says more about yourself on how you hated Barney. Like we interviewed the cra- a parent who was a creator of the I Hate Barney Secret Society. And then talking to him, you sort of see like, he's talking about these Barney addicts and the dysfunctional family. And you start to see like, oh, I could see why he hated Barney because he himself was an alcoholic. His, his, his marriage was falling apart. You're hitting all these sort of cores. Like you talk about a happy family. And if you don't have that, there's something triggering inside you. It's Bob West is the voice of Barney. And he talks about how Barney was in some ways a mirror 
to all the things you didn't like about yourself because he was so pure and so happy all the time. Which is so, the people put all this, read all this into it on something that started so innocently. Yeah. And for, for people who don't know, and you'll learn this in the documentary, is this woman, Cheryl Leach, literally realized there was nothing for her, was it, he was, it was Patrick, two years old? Yeah, two. To just sit and watch. And, I, you know, to me, having a son who who is at the tail end of that, I, there was tons for him to sit and watch, but I, strangely, I, I, I'm backtracking a little here, could understand why someone, to be funny, would start the I Hate Barney newsletter, because I remember there were different things that I was like, oh my God, if I had to listen to it one more time, I was going to kill myself. It's like these parents today who go like, I can't handle any more baby shark. Right, right. Yeah, you know, I, I think there's a, a level of like, is completely okay to be like irritated by Barney and not to like Barney. I like, but, but taking that step to the make your identity around the hate of a, this purple dinosaur that's not meant for you, I think is the taking to the next step. And we just talk about like, sort of these things and like where does hate come from and you talk about like big hate and something little with what you think it has low stakes like barney and throughout our documentary you see there are some consequences between just like you know low stakes hate <laughs> yeah and, and, but again it started so the 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 story behind it's so lovely yeah i mean god it's it's it was two school teaching school two school teacher moms from Allen, Texas, which is like right outside uh, Dallas, Texas, that were like, their son was like an overactive two-year-old and he just, did, he, there was nothing she could put on the TV that could just, you know, calm him down for a minute so she could either get a shower or make dinner or just do something. And she, her family had a production company. She had this idea. They made these tapes and it just went crazy. You know, you, you think it's, you know, this, this dinosaur, this Barney that everyone knows um, had to be made from someone from New York or LA or some like TV giant, but just a school teaching mom. And that's, it's the best thing because they know better. And all the moms in Dallas were calling up Blockbuster, calling up Toys R Us, saying, you got to get this. In the store. It was this campaign they had. It was just so before it's time. It, it very much before. I mean, telemarketing, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She had people calling. Yeah. And then it just got out of control. I mean, it really did. Do you think that the, the Lynch family was prepared for how big it got so fast? No, I don't. You know, because like, you know, Cheryl's husband, he had this whole life in front of him where he was, you know, more or less, you know, his he was running a, a, devel a, a section of his, his father's company. You know, he was the breadwinner, you know, Cheryl at the time was a stay at home mom. So his life completely switched, you know, and I think Cheryl always knew Barney would do well and would be successful. But I don't think anyone can, would have guessed that it would have been that successful because it was literally everywhere. It was crazy. Yeah. So, you know, whenever something is so popular, inevitably people want to tear it down. Absolutely. But... What shocked me was how not just for the comedic value, the hate was real. People on the show were getting, I shouldn't laugh, but they were getting death threats. Yeah. I mean, well, Bob West, who was the voice of Barney, he would get like his, this is early internet too. So it's the first time people kind of like collectively going online to hate something together, you know? Uh, so Bob's email got out and he would get death threats from nine-year-olds that were like, Hey, I'm going to find you. and I'm going to kill you. You know, <laughs> it's like it was, it was, it was really, um, unique. Very, very unique. And the other thing I found so unique is to this day, the people who were involved in the show, whether it be the voice, the body, the music, the production people all talk about that they still would not trade the experience, that it was such a happy group of people making this show. Yeah, I mean, because that was all outside their bubble, right? I mean, here are these people who are, at, when they start making this tape in 1988, it's it's as low budget as possible. It, if you look at those first three tapes, Barney doesn't even look the same. He's like a spray painting of a dark purple, 
he's this really aggressive looking dinosaur. Oh, it's so it's it's so you know in the basement. Oh, totally. Public access. And then for that to happen, and four years later, you're like on the cover, like you know, like all the magazines and all the 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 big big thing, making millions of dollars. I mean, they weren't, but the company was. Uh, you know, to, to come up with that together is an experience that the, they all love and enjoy and are filled with joy. And yeah, they, they did come across some Barney Bashers, but they just were working in the studio in Allen, Texas, doing their thing. And, you know, I think a lot of the crew people didn't see it too much, but it was the people who came out, especially like the children of the show. You know, once they aged out and went to school, imagine being a freshman in high school and you're the kid from Barney, you know, they're, right. you're going to get made fun of. There's this one kid we talked to, but it wasn't in the movie. Uh, they called him Barney boy and they would put him in a trash can and roll him down a hill. You know, like kids were, kids were awful. Yeah. Kids are still awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kids are still awful. Um, you do talk about, and you just touched on it, the rise of the internet and sort of yeah. the group think hate and Barney being one of the first targets. It, 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 and you show clips from, like, MTV. Again, I go back to, this was not the audience. Right. That Barney was targeted to. Right. And yet, it, 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 it hit this crazy nerve. And, do you, I mean, a lot of it is obviously, I mean, we can get super deep and innocence lost and a reflection of things that people didn't have that they wanted. But... The rise, I mean, it was AOL. It was still dial-up, yet there were a ridiculous amount of I hate Barney content. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the first time the word jihad was ever used on the internet was the Jihad Destroy Barney website. Which, by the way, is, when you look at it now, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, 1993, yeah, sure. I mean, obviously then the word wasn't as loaded as it exactly. is now. yeah. But well, you, I mean, and I might get some of this information wrong, but like I remember, you know, some of the guys who were uh, working or, or, or were on the Jihad Destroy Barney, they at one point owned the domain jihad.com. So September 11th, a lot of people were going to that website to try to get like, you know, some sort of, I don't know, they were just for some reason searching that website and they're like, it's just a Barney hate group. We're not, we're not, we're not terrorists, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like they, they got a little nervous during that time. But yet they're still proud of it. You do interview the one who the, the man who created that, and he's still very proud of of what he did and his Barney hate tirades and says he would do it again. Well, I mean, yes and no, right? I think he never liked Barney. He he, he wasn't. He looked back and said, "I don't." It's not that I hated Barney, but he did feel responsibility for like the language he was starting to create. Not he, like he and his group of friends were starting to uh, create. Like he was like. The way we talked on the internet, you know, directly led to the way 4chan was sort of developed. Like the way these sort of this language, and he, he talks about in the film just somewhat feeling that responsibility and feeling bad about it, you know? Well, I mean, look what goes on now. Right. Little did he know the Pandora's box he was opening. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it's not his fault, you know, for 4chan, but like, you know, obviously it's that early, it's the early seeds of all that sort of stuff, you know? We talked about when we were pitching this, it's like America just can't have nice things. You know, here is this character that was just created to teach us how to love. And we we're like, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it, it, absolutely. And the, the other thing that was interesting was a lot of the, the, the Barney haters were predominantly white, male, seemingly middle class, fairly educated yeah, uh, people. I mean, Letterman makes fun of it, and Letterman attracted a very intelligent audience. Yeah, it, what are these? You know what we would call now privileged white men have a problem with Barney? Were people that unhappy already? It it was just interesting the way you know people started to react to it. Like we would see news reports on CBS. And they would interview like journalists and they're like, I think there's something subliminal in the content. They're like, there's gotta be these things that we as adults can't hear. Like they were serious about this. And I have to say my daughter, when when doing this was one years old and I would put Barney on and I could see how they might 
feel the subliminal thing because these kids are like they just glue right into it but obviously i'm joking you know but like it was crazy to see some of these like journalists and like really intelligent people thinking that there was something subliminal in these songs they were singing it's it, it it truly is I mean, your jaw hangs open watching this especially which i i want to talk about is what went on in the leech family yeah and it was very sad what yeah. happened yeah I mean, I mean you can go from the family divorced could uh, the, the couple divorced could have seen that happening the suicide and then patrick shooting someone and going to jail yeah it's a really delicate conversation right and that's what we you know in the in the two hours that we have these two episodes we try to talk about everything that's going around at that time you know like someone might think like um you know oh successful person happy family you know i mean look i mean your your mother was obviously who she was and i'm sure some people might thought like, oh, you have a great upbringing. Also, but you know what happened in your life. Like, I, I don't know, but I'm just guessing. You know, there's always something behind closed doors that people aren't aware of. You know, we look at uh, people like uh, Murphy Brown, uh, Candace Bergen. Like, her father had a six, hugely successful puppet. Like, he was a, I can never say the word right. But the puppet guy, the tranquil. Yeah, ventriloquist. Thank you. Uh, and he had Charlie McCarthy. Yeah. And, you know, she had this unique relationship where she felt like that was her brother. Like, this was like, the more successful, the more famous sibling. And she had a very difficult relationship trying to, to like, get her father's love. You know, the person who uh, created Char- uh, Winnie the Pooh, his son was named Christopher Robin. You know, he, na- he named his character and Winnie the Pooh after his kid and the toys he was playing with. And that kid hated Winnie the Pooh. So it's a really unique relationship that when you come up as your sibling is this not real person that's super successful and taking a lot of your family's attention, you know? And the way we talk about that, you think like, here's this woman who created this amazing character that teaches everyone to love, but there was, you know, drama behind closed doors. Drama in that it just, it took a lot of their time and a lot of their attention and just change their family dynamic. You know, I, I you talk about this and I sit here and I wonder, is it, I mean, obviously you can say it happens in every family where there's some a lot of success because it does take a lot of attention and it does yeah. take a lot of time. Yet, you know, this happened to be directed at a purple dinosaur. When I was watching it and I was watching people all at the University of Nebraska beat up Barney's, it reminded me of that death to disco. Yeah, moment sure. At that at the baseball stadium with the burning of records, it was it was something we were going to address, but we just didn't do it. But it was like that's an idea. It's like disco at one point got so big, everyone woke up the next morning and was like, "I think I hate disco." You know, there there is that level. I mean, like I remember being a Dane Cook fan uh, when I was younger, and then at one point, everyone just started to hate Dane Cook. You know? Oh yeah, um, <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm going to keep my mouth shut on that okay. one. Um, for people who don't know, tell the story of what happened with Patrick. Yeah, it's, it's delicate. Who Barney, just to reiterate, who Barney was created for. Right. Yeah, so, so Cheryl Leach is uh, one of the creators of Barney. Uh, it was her idea. And her son Patrick was two years old at the time. And I just want to say spoilers because, like, you know, if if – people should kind of watch the documentary to see sort of this talked about in a way that's like very delicate, but. Well, there's, yeah, there's a much deeper dive into sure. it. Yeah. Talking about, including that people who worked on it and who were around are very protective. Yeah. I mean, well, like, look, I mean, you read a blog post about whatever happened to Patrick and the family and you just think, Oh, you know, maybe spoiled rich kid or something like that. But they knew him. They knew Cheryl. They knew the family. They knew everything about her. They, it wasn't just some name on the paper. It was a real person and they knew everything they were going through. So it's, it's much different when that sort of stuff happens. Um, but yeah, I mean, Cheryl created Barney for her son, Patrick. Um, and then as Barney got successful, it just changed her family dynamic and Cheryl and her husband divorced. Um, and yeah, and one thing led to another. And there was an instance with Patrick that he was in, he went to jail for a couple of years. So it's just, it's very tragic what happened. And, you know, I spoke to Cheryl. 
she's a wonderful, wonderful person. She's a great mom, you know, and she just is such a positive person that it was a pleasure to be around her. And she was devastated when it happened. You, I mean, you had to be. So, yep, I mean, as a parent, you had to be. Um, Cheryl and Patrick aren't in the documentary. Correct. Or at least not on screen. Right, right. Well, a lot of archival footage, sure. Uh, yeah. Have, and you said you, you've been around her. Where is she, what is she doing now? I mean, because someone who's that creative, the creativity doesn't just shut off. Sure. I mean, she's, she's like, I, when I spoke to her, like we met um, in Sleepy Hollow. It was like somewhere that was in between both of our locations. And um, she just felt like she was really good right now. She just felt very um, at peace. You know, she, um, Barney, you know, it was in 1980s, so it's been like 30 years since Barney uh, was created. Barney was, uh, she sold the company in the early 2000s, so she's been away from Barney for quite some time. Um, she was in a good spot. She's super nice. And when I spoke to her, you know, we wanted her to be in the movie. But, you know, here's a person that even during the heyday of Barney never really addressed the Barney hate. You know, some people even on like the writers of Barney would be like, should we address this? Should we say this? Should we get ahead of it? Uh, and she just never did it. She treated it like, you know, flies. She just kind of like shoot it away, you know? Um, and so if we were ever to make a documentary called I Love You about Barney, I think she would totally have been in it. But once you address that hate and the story of like how, you know, Barney in some ways is her son, her other son. It's, it's really a story of a mother and two sons just weren't right. extremely popular. So when people would bash, when the San Diego chicken would go to these baseball parks and beat up Barney in front of this large crowds, she looked at it as like someone beating up her son. So she took it very personally. So it was definitely and one of the main reasons she wasn't in our film. There was a lawsuit. And again, this is the stuff that answered, uh, that, that interested me for a number of reasons. Um, I guess the San Diego chicken. First of all, that the guy did the interview in the chicken suit. That was it. He was... He to be he refused to show his face he's like i do not do interviews as ted i only do interviews as the chicken which i found endlessly like that on a whole other level i found endlessly amusing yeah, oh yeah um but so he was sued and they actually used the parody law yeah which is something that pertains to a lot of comedians when people try and sue them for defamation yeah and the San Diego chicken won the suit using the parody law against to, 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 uh, that he was allowed to beat up Barney. Yeah. And because it's, it's public domain and it's comedy and, you know, it, all these different things. The fact that it went to court. Yeah. Kills me. Well, I mean, so that was the one thing. And I, Stephen White, the writer of Barney, you know, did address it that they just didn't handle any of that stuff correctly. Like they got, anytime someone bashed Barney, the Barney people went after them and was lawsuits. The, the Jihad destroyed Barney people, they got uh, cease and desist, but they kept going. You know, there was, there was so many claims that the Barney people were doing it. Some of it was like a little unnecessary, but some of it made sense. Like some people had like, costume shops and were selling illegal like Barney suits like that makes sense you know but it was quite ridiculous that the San Diego chicken was getting sued by Barney the dinosaur however one of the great moments in legal history <laughs> right right yeah you've done a lot of other really interesting work and you seem to to focus on groups celebrities institutions that have an established brand but previously sort of unseen dirty undersides including santa claus yeah i try to look find something that's in front of everyone but look at it a different way like my first documentary was i am santa claus and we we wanted to know like here's a person that's in your family photo every year like what family does he go home to you know we found we had this you know great santa santa jim who was a gay santa there was a swinger santa a guy legally changed his name to santa claus uh, you know, one Santa got real drunk on his birthday and that was hilarious. So it was this really like, here are these real people and they've done real things and they made mistakes. But for that minute that you're, they're with your kid, they're perfect. So it's about like identity and community and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, you do find the humor. Oh yeah, a oh yeah. A lot of it. I mean, when you're going to a swinger club with a Santa Claus, it's very humorous. But how are you going to explain that to your daughter? 
<laughs> what the swingers club? That you went to a swingers club with Bar with the uh, Santa. Well, it's very easy. It was not, it wasn't open at the time, so I didn't see anything. <laughs> oh man, that would have been a big memory. Uh, y- you also, which again brings it back to Barney, you produced a thing a, a doc called Ghost Heads. Yeah, and it's a documentary about obsessive Ghostbuster fans. And that same year, the whole female cast was introduced, and I mean, people went crazy. Yeah, crazy that they were turning using women in Ghostbusters. Why do you think that was? I mean, and I didn't know there were obsessive Ghostbuster fans, by the way. Yeah, I mean, there's an obsessive everything fan, you know. But like, <laughs> you know, we 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 made that movie as they were making theirs, you know, and we followed around people who, you know, make Ghostbusters their identity, where they have their own, they build their own proton packs. They make their own suits. They go to children's hospitals and these things and like cheer up children. You know, this one woman, she was an alcoholic and she, and by watching Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters over and over, it kind of got her out of her, her issues and is, you know, many years clean now. So there's all this like great things that comes from the fandom, but this whole like, and we didn't address it in the movie because it, it really was like we were wrapping up as the movie was coming out. So we didn't really see much of that sort of reaction but it's certainly there. And the way people nowadays feel the need to protect their childhood, like you're ruining my childhood, is the most ridiculous thing in the world. Like we sort of address this in Barney, whereas like we talk about bashing and how simple bashing does cause, you know, big consequences. Like in 1999, Star Wars episode one comes out, right? And everyone hates that movie. They hate Jar Jar Banks. They hate the actor, Jake Lloyd, the, the kid character. And they, but they, I mean, the movie was awful. Sure, right? But like, you can. I think there's a level of like feeling like you could not like something, but to go to the the kid, you know, Jake Lloyd, right. and harass the way this they the this kid got harassed in school and college and life. He's schizophrenic now. Like he's he has to stay at home with his mom. Like it 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 didn't it didn't work out for him in that way. Like that movie ruined his life. And so by protecting your childhood as a Star Wars fan, you actually ruined a real person's childhood. You know, so it's like the way fans of like with the new mermaid or Velma from Scooby-Doo or Ghostbusters in 2016 or any of the Star Wars stuff, it's really ridiculous how some of the fans just go too far because they don't treat any of these people like people. You know, all hate comes from dehumanizing people. And we try to humanize some of the people in Barney. So when you're saying something bad, you can kind of feel it. Like, obviously, like, there's jokes, you know, uh, you know, like Letterman or Leno would make of Barney or any of that sort of stuff. But I think there's some people who aren't like professional comedians uh, that take it too far. And it it leads a little bit more with hate. What are you working on next? I mean, I want to go back and watch everything because you're. Oh. Your topics fascinate me. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. I, I love the, the documentary about your mother, too. I, I remember watching that when it came out. I really enjoyed it. I remember her looking at her calendar and, like, saying, like, if she ever saw, like, a blank date, that's when she got scared. I, me- I just remember how good that was. So that was great. Right. So what are you working on next? We're actually, you know, Barney's the big project, but I have this smaller one I'm working on because I, I wanted to, to see it finish. Uh, it's a documentary called The House From, and we have a Kickstarter called TheHouseFrom.com. And it's all about people who live in famous houses. Like, what does the, the house from Full House look like? Uh, Home Alone, Golden Girls, uh, trains, planes, and automobiles. We've been to all these houses, talk to the owners of these houses, and try to figure out, not try to figure out, but see what it's like to live in a famous house. Like, I mean, if you remember the movie Friday, people go up to this woman's house and stick their head in the window and say, break yourself. You know, the Walter right. White House in Albuquerque, people throw a, like a pizza on the roof because it happened in the show. So this really weird, unique relationship with people who live in famous houses from movies and TV shows. Do you do the spooky houses too? Um, I mean, we've been to like some haunted, not haunted, uh, like so like, oh, like the Amityville Horror House. I haven't been to that one and I should because it's not too far from me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we've been to the Halloween house. We've been to the Silence of the Lambs. But yeah, I should do that one. We're, we're going to Albuquerque this weekend and uh, Tulsa for the, um, the Outsider's House. So... Well, very cool. Where where can we find some of your other work? Um, I think that you know I'm on Instagram, uh, Tommy Avalone three. 
and my name's A-V-A-L-L-O-N-E. But I think the best way would probably be doublewindsorfilms.com. I have to jazz that website up a little bit, but that's where all the movies are. They're right there. Well, you people have to watch Barney. I Love You, You Hate Me on Peacock, a two-part documentary. I loved it. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Tommy, a pleasure to meet you. 